for you. I am Judy Keniston, and I chair the Commission on the General Conference. And I am finishing a, an eight-year term on the Commission, the last four as the chair. Last quadrennium, I was the chair of the Rules Committee. So I totally felt for our chair yesterday as, as he stood in presenting the rules, because it was a similar experience. That's our first big, that's the first time we come together at General Conference, and it's, it's where everyone begins to make their opening statements, if, if to put it um, gently. <laughs> so, so you have a lot of that uh, wrangling that comes up in the rules. So how many were present as we did the sessions yesterday, last evening? Oh, good, just about everything. Um, just a, a quick um, uh, something, just a, just a little bit about me um, to start out with. First of all, I have connections with several seminaries. My um, husband uh, attended, and I, we were married at the time, Garrett Evangelical, so have a uh, good experience in, from Evanston, good. Uh, uh, he also was at um, SMU at, at Perkins for his D-Men, and so we were back and forth in that context. And uh, our daughter graduated from Candler a few years ago, and I know there's some Candler grads in here. Um, and, and of course, we have students at, from our conference that attend um, a variety of seminaries. So we do, we do keep up with you, and I get the seminary reports for our, um, our conference materials that go in our conference journals. So we do try to keep up with what's, with what's going on. So I'm, I'm really glad that you can be here and that those that are joining us um, by streaming. Are, are you in a class? Can I ask? A, is that a, so is everybody, and is everybody in the same class? You're doing the kind of same? No, okay. okay Just my, my, for my benefit for the learning experience. Um, so, what I would th thought I would go back a little bit. Um, one of the things that we did this um, general conference, I mean, for this general conference on the commission, um, and you may have heard this because it was, it was our first major controversial thing that we did probably was setting the number of delegates at general conference, which was, it was lower than we've, we've done in the past. Constitutionally, as you know, we are between 600 and 1,000 delegates for every general conference, and it's equally divided between lay and clergy. And, we, and there's a formula that allows um, the, the, general secret the Secretary of the General Conference to um, allocate those delegates among the, um, among the annual conferences. Uh, and that's done on membership of the, of the annual conferences, which is a little bit of a challenge um, because different annual conferences, particularly as we have added annual conferences in the central conferences, um, do their membership in different ways because the central conferences have some flexibility that, that we don't have here in, in the United States. So getting those numbers is a bigger challenge than you, than you would realize um, so that they can be allocated. And that's one of the reasons that it sometimes seems like it takes a long time. It's also one of the reasons that in 2012, um, it was approved that you could do your elections um, two years in advance. And I think some of the jurisdictional conferences have done that. It wasn't really necessary for a jurisdictional conference to do it, but they kind of jumped on doing it. And so, so some of the delegates that are here from the jurisdictional conferences have been elected for two years. I mean, they, they were elected in 2014. But the real reason to do that was to give the central conferences um, enough time to get their delegates elected um, and, uh, and have some um, training and continuity for, for that delegation. Um, we still, we're still working on that because it's not a, a, a perfect solution. So um, when, we came, when we came, when the number came outside of the, of the constitutional um, number. It was way over a thousand by the formula. Um, it came to the commission to set the number of, of uh, delegates for, for general conference. Now, this is the first time it's been the commission's responsibility. Last quadrennial, well, up pre previously, it was the um, responsibility of the secretary of the general conference to set that number. Well, last quadrennium, after he had talked about setting it as a lower number. That wasn't an overly popular idea, and um, so they took the responsibility of it from him and gave it to the commission. I'm not sure what the General Conference really expected to have happen because the commission for a number of, of quadrennium, not, not last quadrennium when I was actually on it, but prior to that, two different, year, two different 
years they had brought to general conference a proposal to lower the number of delegates. So it was kind of the, the tradition in looking at, um, at what, would, um, what they might do. The general conference kind of should have realized that that might happen. But um, so when it came to the commission, um, the number was set at 850, which is it was within the, within the constitutional range, with the 600 to 1,000. Um, and so, and that was the number. It's, it's actually, we, I think we have 864 delegates, and that's because some of those, uh, we didn't have the exact numbers on the Central Conference. When they, when they sent the numbers out to the, to the conferences, there were some conferences that hadn't reported their numbers yet, and so it just, they, it had to be adjusted up a little bit. So that, that was a, a, our first big decision that really got a lot of um, uh, response to it, and, um, and it was actually sent to the Judicial Council to see if we had the authority to set that number uh, where we did, and the Judicial Council ruled that, it, that we did. That was the, given to us by the General Conference. Part of the, the, the um, well, in almost entirely, the Commission's thinking was a smaller General Conference would help us as we looked at moving the General Conference outside of the United States. Um, it, it has financial implications, obviously, there is some savings to doing that, but if you think about the cost of general conference, the number of delegates, you do save some money, but you don't, there are things that have to be provided regardless of how many delegates are actually present. So, I mean, you still have to have rooms for legislative committees and, and all the interpreters and all the things that have to happen. So the, the cost of general conference is, um, is, isn't based entirely on the number of delegates that you have. But that was, that was one of the things that, the, um, that the, this, this commission did. Um, I, well, I wanted to go back to, to in um, 1968 when we merged. Um, prior to that, the constitutional number was 600 to 800. So the number of the delegates at General Conference prior to 1968 for the Methodist Church was 600 to 800. So it was always smaller. The general conference was smaller, and, and you know I know you're you're probably much better at, his, at the Methodist history than I am. But it, we started off with only clergy, okay. uh, and, and a very small number of clergy, and they met for an entire month. And so we've gone from only clergy meeting for an entire month to nearly a thousand people meeting for ten days. Um, there's a big difference in what you can accomplish in that time, in the type of conferencing that you can do. Um, so when we, when we merged, the number was increased to 600 to 1,000, and that was to help us encourage um, to have enough representative from the um, former EUB uh, conferences to make sure that that, that representation was there. That's why the number was increased to 1,000 um, originally. So the commission's view is like it's really not going to hurt us to go back to the 800 range. Um, and, and we're well above that anyway. So that, that was kind of some of the thinking in, in, in the historical perspective of, of that. The commission's responsibilities are um, very, um, I mean, there's a lot of practical things. One of the things that we do is set the amount, the per diem, the amount that the delegates get for, for their um, expenses per day. Um, we set the locations and we have now um, uh, set the locations through 2028. Um, in 2020, we'll be in Minneapolis, 2024 in Manila, 2028 in Zimbabwe. There are some, I mean, there's going to be some flexibility. New commissions will come on. They'll have, um, you know, th those decisions that will be um, adjusted and, and made. The commission is made up of um, people from every central conference, every jurisdiction, and then there are a few additional uh, members that are, are in there for balance. So there are some that there are, you know, you might have more than a couple from, from a jurisdiction on there for various reasons. It also has as uh, officers or ex officio members, the secretary of the general conference, the business manager, um, the, the treasurer, and one representative from the council of bishops. 
we had felt that last quadrennium, we just didn't have a really good connection with the council, uh, our, the member that was assigned to us didn't attend our meetings. We, didn't, we just didn't feel like the connection was there with the Council of Bishops. So we actually requested additional um, bishops to attend. And we have um, uh, Bishop Christian Austed, who's the bishop of I should know this. He's he's in Nor in Norway uh, uh, and and Russia. That's um, and he and he came and he really worked a lot with us um, in in our rules committee, um, which I think uh, I think you'll you can see some of, of his uh, imprint on on the rules. Um, and he has he also represented faith and order the faith and order um, committee, not the legislative committee, but the the um, Standing Committee that uh, works with uh, just inter interpretation of our um, theology. And, and so a lot of the idea of the Christian conferencing, it was, it, he helped in forming that. Um, and that, has, that was rooted in the request from the 2012 General Conference that we work to make um, our decision making and, our, and the way that we um, the way that we make the conference together, make decisions to, to that it be a different process. And so some of the things that that came out of that were that we just, well, one of the things was we looked at the Constitution. There is actually in our Constitution currently nothing about general conference doing anything other than legislation. There's, that's it. You come here to do legislation, all the, all the extra things that people you know, appreciate are not part of our constitution. So we've, we've proposed a constitutional amendment that, that they would be, that worship and prayer and fellowship would be part of what general conference is. I'm hoping that that will be a non-controversial um, contra, uh, uh, constitutional amendment because I think people don't realize that. You know, really, constitutionally, we're here to do business. And if we don't have worship, if we don't pray, if we don't talk to each other, that's okay. We just have to get here and vote. And you know, that's not, I don't think that's what any of us want as in, in the way that we fun, function. Um, so that, that's one of the things that we, we brought forth. Another thing, um, and, and our idea of that Christian conferencing would, would encompass all of what we do at General Conference, um, it, it, gave, it gave birth to um, looking for a way to have discussions about legislation that would, um, would allow us to talk with each other in, in a way other than three, three speeches against, four and three against, and, and taking a vote, and winner takes all. That's, that's what we were trying to do is just let people, um, let the, all of the delegates be more engaged in decisions. So we looked at a variety of um, conference policies, conference, um, uh, Ways, ways that conferences in uh, the jurisdictions and the central conferences already do this. Um, there are a number of, um, of the conferences that have some sort of um, discernment process in their discussion. Uh, this was particularly um, popular with the central conference members of our commission because they are not that familiar with Robert's rules. Robert's Rules, as one of our members says, the only time I ever use Robert's Rules is at General Conference. It's not, it's not part of, of the way they operate. So, um, so that is, we begin looking at that. And one of, the tr one of the churches that does this well is the Uniting Church of Australia. And so we, t we were in conversation with them and their general secretary and um, who is actually here at conference with us to assist us in this process if the rule is, is approved. Um, but through his, their process, and their process didn't fit us exactly, it wouldn't have been constitutional for the way that we do our work. Um, but so we, we adjusted that, um, the process. So we end the process, and in the Australian, um, in the Uniting Church of Australia, they continue the process. They keep coming back and doing the discussion and the discernment over and over. We, we really didn't have, partly for time and partly because we knew we needed to have a vote to make sure that we would be constitutionally sound. So our, our procedure comes back and we do take a vote. We do have discussion. We, we vote and we discuss parliamentary according to our, to our rules. 
um, and then we take a vote. So I, I think that it's totally constitutional. You may have read that that there's um, there are people that have said that that it's not that's not the case, but um, we feel from the commission um, that that it will be if it's if it's tested by the judicial council, it would be constitutionally sound, and any decision we made with that process would be. Are you familiar with Rule 44? Okay, great. Um, the it may not be perfect, and maybe I shouldn't be saying this through loud stream before it's voted on. No, I, I, I will say this. It is not perfect. I'm sure that it can be perfected. It, the, the rule could get better as we use it. But it's a, I think it's a tool that we can adopt. Um, we can use this. It, my personal feeling is that we need to adopt the rule even if we don't use it at general conference this time. If we don't use it on the legislation that, that's being proposed by the commission, um, I, I think the rule is really important so that we have it in place so that we can make the plans for 2020 to use it with some of the structure proposals that are out there, um, some of the things that, that are coming up. I would love to use it this, this time, but, but the, we need to have the rule there so that it can, be, it can be perfected and that we can plan to use it. We've made the plans to use it at this general conference, but it's been a little bit frustrating because we know expense-wise, uh, training-wise, getting the nominations from uh, the various places that they had to come, that you might be doing all of this and then not any of it being used. Um, so I think it's really important that the rule be, that the rule be approved. Um, are there anybody in here who's voting? I'm not going to, one, okay. I, I don't, I don't want to be accused of, uh, of trying to, uh, to persuade, uh, persuade a group right before we take a vote, but um, I mean, that, that's my personal feeling that I think it's a, it's a, um, a, you know, it could be a really powerful tool that we have to use. Um, I'm kind of getting to the end of my time, and I could, I could go on. I have lived General Conference for the last four years, really for the last eight, but definitely for the last four, where almost every day I was dealing with something um, that came up. I will, no, I will go to one other piece of legislation that I would, um, I would speak about. There's a, there's a petition to move, basically to do away with the commission in General Conference. I said, when, when you get a petition to do away with, you know you've, you've done something right because you've made somebody mad. <laughs> you know, you're, you're acting, you're, you're doing something. So, um, but, but the idea was to fold it into the connectional table. There's a couple of problems with that. The connectional table is a programming body. Um, their, their funding comes from a different place than the commission's current funding does. The, the leadership of the commission is, um, is there in a different capacity than, and, and it, could, we, it could happen, but this is my thought, that if you try, if the, uh, the connectional table had to take this task on, they would probably need additional staff people because you could not do um, the amount of, of work that, that the current commission does if you also had all these other focuses that you have. You would also lose the diversity of the commission. I think that's one of the huge gifts. It's, it's also one of the huge challenges um, to deal with the diversity, but it's a gift to the, to the church that the commission has that perspective, that very, very broad perspective. Um, you would lose that because you can't take all of, the, all of the diversity that's part of connectional table, which I will say is less diversity than is actually on the smaller commission. You can't take that and put it all in the group that would be doing the commission work because you have to, they have much, the connectional table has much to do. So I would definitely say that would be, it would be a mistake for us to move in that direction. Um, you know, the general conference has every right to, to direct the, the, the commission how to do the things that they want, how they do, and which they did, and we followed their mandate from 2012 in this time. But it, you know, there's always gonna be somebody that's, that. The, the mandate that we received isn't the mandate that they wanted. So um, anyway, that, that would be one, uh, a move that I think would be a mistake for the church. So I'm gonna open it up to questions uh, for you if you have any uh, questions about, if that I maybe can answer for you about uh, the, the workings behind General Conference. I'd be happy to answer. And if you'd come to a mic, um, you don't have, you can put your back to the camera, but you can come to the mic and speak and, um, and, and your question will go out on the live stream.
I'm, I don't think I don't think it's on here. Oh, yeah. I think. Okay. I just wondered if you could speak a little bit more to the proportionality in deciding um, who gets um, what kind of uh, voice at general conference in terms of delegates, and particularly in relationship to maybe some of the smaller um, central conference. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can I can speak to that some. I mean, this is a general conference decision. That's not that's again not a commission's decision. But um, she's asking about the proportionality, um, and that's that is a, a a big conversation that's going on right now. There, it, it's one of those. How do you be fair? What what is fair in terms of proportionality? Is it it? One of the examples is you know we have. Um, in the Philippines, we have multiple annual conferences that are very small. And by our constitution, everyone is, is allowed, a, um, one clergy, one lay, every annual conference is allowed one, one clergy and one lay. So proportionally, they have a much higher percentage of representation for their numbers than, say, um, a jurisdictional conference that may have many, many more, more members but the annual conference is limited to, to this number. Um, the question of proportionality, and we've never, we've never been a proportional church, and we haven't, we've never made our decisions by, by proportionality, um, because we have tried to um, make sure that all, all, all areas are, are um, heard. So, there's, there's some accusations, well, well, maybe you're trying to, to create the conferences so that you have the, the representation. I don't know what the reason for the creations of uh, multiple annual conferences, but one of the proposals is that they would, um, it would be by a, uh, Episcopal area so that you would have, rather than your annual conferences, you would have your assignment of, um, of delegates by Episcopal area. Um, that might help in terms of limiting, you know, to increasing the number of people per delegate from some of the uh, small, small conferences. But how many of you are from a conference that only sends two delegates? Um, so, you know, when you're talking about proportionality, if you change, if you change that, now how many of you share share an Episcopal area? How many of those conferences that you raised your hands? So, so yours would possibly even go down. You would lose representation from your annual conference. Um, I come from a small state in, uh, you know, uh, population-wise. We have, we have lots of land mass, but we don't have a lot of people because our land goes up and down <laughs> in mountains. But, um, you know, we get two, two senators in the, in the state, in the federal senate. So, you know, I'm thinking, well, proportionality, that's really not fair. We shouldn't, West Virginians shouldn't be represented in the same way that Californians and Texans are. But, but I think it's important that we get that kind of representation. So that's how I feel about it. Does that answer your question? Okay, thank you. Others? Hi. Hi. Um, you were talking about the Australian church mm -hmm. that has helped you with Robert's rules. Do they have something similar to a Rule 44? They actually operate entirely. That, in fact, that's how we based Rule 44 on the Uniting Church of Australia's um, rules. They do not use Robert's rules at all. All of their um, all of their work is is done by this by their discernment process, not by Rule 44, but by their discernment process. And I do want to make sure that people understand that we're not actually just taking theirs and plopping it on top of us. We it, it was developed um, more for this, you know, for our situation. Um, but they do that. They do their discernment process. They have, they started it in the late 1990s, not, you know, like 1999. And, and he says it's actually transformed just the way they do their discussion. Let me speak just a little bit about um, Rule 44 in terms of the areas where we've had a lot of um, uh, uh, questions. The facilitation group, which is a group of six persons, and they are nominated, they come from a pool of 24. They're nominated by the, um, the discernment group of the Council of Bishops, and then the executive committee 
we'll put forth a slight of these six. That, that was the whole, oh, we don't have enough representation on the, well, the, the idea is not that they, that this group is not necessarily to be a representative group of the entire church. It's their, their job is to take, is to see what the groups have said on the, on the sheets and, and take actually everybody's opinion and, and look at trends and see how we might, how we might do that. This part comes from the Uniting Church. That, that's exactly part of their process. And they're, um, but what they do, with the, one of the things that we had to make this sure that, okay, these are all elected, that they're all delegates. And in the Uniting Church, they don't do that. They just have a group of people who are really good at this. And they say, this group of people are going to, this table here is going to do this for us because you guys are really good at writing, uh, writing legislation and coming up and, and discerning this. We don't have that trust level in our, in our church for us to just appoint people to do that. I'd love it if we did, but we don't. So that's, we've adjusted their process to, to fit more of what we have to do. Yes. Hi, um, you mentioned that even if we don't use Rule 44 at this conference, you would still like it to be approved. Um, and I'm just wondering like, how exactly that would happen, because as I understand it right now, if Rule 44 is approved, it will be used. Um, yeah, that's not, yeah, that's not right. That's, yeah. Okay, so how how does that work then sure. when you pick which le legislation will go under Rule 44? Yeah, um, yeah that's that. I've tried to make that clear as we've gone through um, as I've if I, as I've talked to different groups about Rule 44. No, there is a two-step process here. Rule 44 would be part of our general conference rules. It would be approved. the the way, The way the rule would work is approved in the rules. The legislation that it's used with is a separate step. If Rule 44 is approved, then the commission will recommend that we use it with the petitions that are there in the DCA. Um, that there, and there is a new, I don't know whether you're aware of this, that we've lowered the number. Um, so if, if it's approved, it would be, then we would recommend it. The, con the, the general conference could say, no, we don't want to deal with those petitions in this way. And we would move on and and do that all in legislative committee. So that's that's the that's the step. But the, then the rule would be there. It would be available to be used. Um, so it's a two-step process. It's two decisions. It's two votes. It's very. But the next general conference, if that if the rule is approved now, the rule would be in effect as we came to general conference. The commission could make its intentions known or, or not. I mean, I don't guess they would have to, but they could say, you know, this is, the, this is our intent. And it could just be two petitions that they may be using the rule on. Um, or it could be a collection of petitions, say, um, the, uh, the Global Book of Discipline, or the General Book of Discipline that, that, that's being proposed. I mean, that might be what we look at in, with, with rule. In, in, and it might have parts in different com that would be put in different committees, but they would be brought together. So that's what, um, yeah, that it would be there. But the rule would already be approved. It would be in the rules, and then you could use it for other legislation. So, and I think that's one of the pro that's one of the things that we've kind of fought. The the fact that the commission actually stated these are the rules. This is what we're going to use. The rule got tied up with the legislation, and and so it's been the interpretations have been that way. Yeah. Thank you for that question, so I could clarify it. I think, I, I'm not sure what our time is. Our, <laughs> you give me a signal when, we, when we're out of time, yeah. I'm not, well, yeah. We need to adjourn about 10 to 8. Oh, okay, then we, we're good, all right, great, okay. Um, it seems like one of the biggest, um, concerns that I'm seeing about the whole Rule 44 thing is the monitoring system. Mm. So can you talk about that a little bit more? I and can, yeah. Um, the monitoring system, well, for one thing, the monitoring system was put in place because of the um, concern that it wouldn't be a safe place for delegates to have conversations. So the monitoring system, and you know, we've had monitors for many general conferences, but the, the difference in the, the, what's proposed for the monitors is that they actually have the, um, the, they have permission to signal the group leader when, at the time something is happening. If, you know, if you've been, if you've ever observed a legislative committee, um, 
the, the monitors would come and report and say, you know, these are the things that we observed. But it would be the next day or the next afternoon or whatever. So, but this is actually, the monitors were empowered to say, that, you know, that language could be harmful. Can, uh, please be aware. It'd still be up to the group leader to, to have that, have the authority to say, you know, to, to um, control the group or to, you could ignore the monitor. We would hope the group leader wouldn't do that. Um, so that, that extra power, and I think that's what the objection has been, is that, that, that they have this some kind of uh, power. They really don't. They just, it's, just a, it's just a help for the committee, for the group, to be able to, to um, keep on task and, and, and not, it, it's sometimes hard for the group leader to, um, who is a member of the group, to, to call out those behaviors. So that's, that's it. The monitors would not be, um, would not be uh, delegates. That's the, that's the one thing, they're, they are out, they're not delegates. They have been, and this will be actually be proposed today, the rule states that they would be members of G Corps or, in, or that they would be, yeah, they would be part of the G Corps and Kajro, um monitoring teams, but that's the intention is that those groups will have assisted us in providing the monitors. So that's not like G Corps and Cosro didn't, because they're not monitoring in the same way. You'll see that as we go through, um, through um, general conference, that the monitoring system for, from G Corps is very different than it has been in the past. So does that answer your question? You may not be on there. Um, I was curious, uh, on the monitoring topic, um, how, uh, how interculturally competent are the monitors? Because what might be inappropriate in my context, totally appropriate in another context. Mm -hmm. um, there are guidelines that we have produced um, and with examples, if, you've, if you have a copy of the, of the uh, delegate handbook. There, there are specific guidelines with examples um, of the types of behaviors. We are hoping, and we've worked with Just Peace for these monitors. I actually think our monitors may might be a strength of the system because, well, I I don't know how to word this correctly, but they they don't have to be. They aren't delegates, so we we are we have a little bit more ability to to select monitors who do have the the uh, cultural um, uh, the ability to monitor in, in different cultural situations. So I think where we don't have that with we don't have that with delegates. We don't have it with the facilitation team because we have to use you know what the the council bishop sends to us and whether whether they understood well what we what we needed in the facilitation team and the and the annual conferences sent their mo their um, small group leaders so whether whether they sent the peop the best people for that we don't know but with monitors we had a little bit more flexibility so i'm i'm trusting that just peace um, because they've done such good work for us um, it, as a, at the general conference um, in the past that they would um, would provide us with that, but you're you're right. I mean that that it, they're going off guidelines. That's the only way we really can, um, and that's true. With, that's always been true with our monitors. Hi. Um, how do you respond to concerns um, that people have about? Um, Rule 44 centralizing the decision making too much, where general conference is a very you know open and legislative process, like not legislative, but with a large group participation. Um, like, what would be your response to that? Well, first of all, um, you're you're looking at contribution from every delegate at general conference. So I don't see how we can get more input than that. You know, w normally we have a. a a petition that comes to a legislative committee that's handled maybe by a subcommittee of six, eight people. Um, then it's approved by the legislative committee. It goes on a consent calendar. I mean, that's not nearly as broad as what as having input from every delegate. Now, I think part of the, your concern is probably because that's that's my gut reaction. Everybody gets to say anything. 
um, is that the facilitation team now gets to take that and, um, and so that's where you're thinking, oh, these six people, well, already it's as broad as what you had in your subcommittee um, if you actually just want to go with numbers. But their job is not to, um, their job isn't the same as the legislative subcommittees would be in that they would, their job is to take and interpret and, and, and then put out something that is representative of all those voices. So what that's, that criticism is not really understanding the intent of the purpose. And then it's on the floor and it's debated and it's voted on. So it's not like these six people get to make this whole decision and it's done for the church. It's, it's part of the process. So I really think it's much broader than what we do now in legislative committees, but it's actually similar to what we do in legislative committees. It's just on a, a much broader scale, much man, many more voices involved. So does that answer that question? <laughs> I don't have my ADCA out right now. Um, when it's being debated on the floor, is it able to be amended? Yeah, it's, it, it's with our um, normal rules of the general conference, mm -hmm. which uh, people will say, oh, we do it with Robert's rules. Our, our rules of general conference, if you remember yesterday when the bishops got a little confused there about what, and some, one of the delegates had stood up and said, Robert's rule says this. Well, our rules don't say that. We, our rules are primary, Robert's rules are secondary, and, um, and even the bishops got confused on that. But yeah, we would use it according to our rules to debate, you know, it could be amended however, I mean, it, it would be legislation just as all of our legislation is. It would just be maybe a little bit more directed petition that, that might um, encompass the ideas of, that have been presented. Do you have one more question? Um, I'm curious about, uh, you mentioned that there's some legislation to eliminate the commission. And, um, and then there was a mention about the commission uh, being more diverse than the connectional table. Um, how does the commission define diversity? Um, well, I was defining it in terms of representation from throughout the general church. Um, we have on the commission a member of the commission from every central conference. So that right there, we, that's, that, that's what I was talking about in terms of diversity of the, of the church. Um, we also, um, and this, I, I don't think we can place people necessarily on commissions by their theological diversity, but our commission is extremely theologically diverse. Um, and and it's, been, it's actually been incredibly um, interesting to have those discussions within, within the commission. And because we're small enough, I mean, it's, it's still a large group of people, but we have 25 members of the commission. And if that's small enough that you develop relationships over time. It takes a little while, but, um, but people had close relationships. You knew what people's were, things were happening in their families. And so when we had those theological discussions, it, um, it was really very helpful for our, for, so that, those are the two areas that I'm defining I'm not, in terms of um, basically location and, um, and theological position. <coughs> and I'm not saying, actually it's the location part for the CT that I say we're more diverse than, theologically CT is just as diverse as we are. <laughs> Thank you for that question though. We're having to cut the live stream, so anything that happens from this point forward will not be on. The All right, so <laughs> wave goodbye. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Where can you find Robert's Rules? Um, that her question is, where can you find Robert's Rules? Um, Robert's Rules. There, there. Um, there's a book that's about this thick. That's detailed Robert's Rules. And let me just say one word about Robert's Rules. They, it, Robert's Rules was originally begun for um, church discussion. I mean, it was, that's, that's kind of the way it was planned. And, um, and we have 
it has been assumed throughout um, the business world too. So we've taken that on. And there are very few people that know Robert's Rules really, really well. There are some because they can call you on anything. But um, they also have little abbreviated books that you can, um, that will, you know, can kind of give you a thing. And then there's a cheat sheet that's like a page long. You'll see that sometimes the bishops will, at, at annual conference or whatever, they'll have that because it, it will say, you know, this is amendable, this is non-debatable, this, you know, that, that kind of thing. So um, Robert's Rules, I will confess, I have not read all of Robert's Rules. I, I, I go and look things up when I need to, but sometimes... You know, we, we modify what the way we do, even though we're, we're really good at saying, oh, that needs to be seconded, or, or it's come from a committee, it doesn't have to be seconded, whatever, however, you know, but if, if you make, if you meet in a little, in a, everybody here has met in a committee, I'm sure, you've met in a committee, you make your decision, you, you modify Robert's rules, unless you're really a stickler. You modify them to make the process. You, you can, we kind of do a modified consensus, say a church council meeting, we, we, but but you'll back into Robert's rules. Okay, we need we need a motion on that. We need a second, and and then and then we we use them. So most meetings we very much modify Robert's rules for um, on a casual sort of basis. And the general conference has modified them on a formal basis because we have our own rules of um, uh, rules of order, and then we use Robert's rules if we get into a stickling point. But, and if you can imagine yesterday's discussion with the bishops getting confused about Robert's rules and getting tied up in parliamentary procedure and all that thing. Picture this from someone who doesn't experience Robert's rules already. I mean, those of us are kind of used to it. We're like, yeah, yeah, that happens. But if you don't, if, that, if all this is new to us and the word, even the wording, well, here's an example. In, um, in uh, some African conferences, um, to put something on the table means to dis that you're going to discuss it, which makes total sense. I mean, you're gonna, okay, we're going to put this on the table and we're going to talk about it. For us, in Robert's Rules, to put something on the table means you're not going to talk about it. So that, just that kind of language within Robert's Rules is very confusing for people. But yeah, you can look on, uh, online or you probably have one in your bookstore. <laughs> I didn't bring mine with me to, to General Conference, I have to confess. It's, you know, it, it weighs. It, it weighs too much. So. <laughs> Let's thank Judy for her. Thank you. I appreciate your attention. I appreciate that you're here learning and, and that you are, you are, if you haven't already been a delegate, your future, you know, that, that could be uh, where, where you'll be serving. Um, and if not, your, just your interpretation of general conference in your local context will be really valuable. So thank you very much. Thank you. For putting up with a tired me. So. <laughs>